A good day to everybody. We have invited today uh, the special envoy of the Secretary General on Syria, uh, Mr. Stefan de Mistura, to give a briefing to the whole membership as there was a briefing the other day at the Security Council. It's of course, in the light of the recent developments in Syria and the region, it's crucial that the United Nations enhance, enhance the level of, of the, their engagement and contribute to restoring a sustainable peace and stability. And we are very hopeful that a momentum can now be uh, created. I'm pleased to invite you to ask a few questions to Mr. de Mistura. Time constraints will not allow more than three questions. I think that even without your invitation, they would probably do so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. I, I thank very much the President of the General Assembly. You see, uh, I do briefings to the Secretary General, of course, who is my boss, and then to the Security Council. But there are so many other countries who are not present in the Security Council and were not present in Vienna. And, uh, and I think it's fair that they do have a briefing. So I did uh, give a briefing on Vienna 1 and on Vienna 2 and reminded them about the, the, the deliverables which came out from both important meetings, particularly on Vienna 1, the paragraph 7, which you're all familiar with regarding the future political roadmap regarding a political process in Syria. And on Vienna 2, the two parallel uh, aspects of related to a nationwide ceasefire, but connected to a political uh, dialogue to take place in Geneva. And um, we got some questions, and I answered some answers. And uh, now I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Majid Gilly from Rodao Media Network that's based in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, I want to ask you about, uh, um, do you have a, an idea by now about the list of participants in future talks in Syria. I, um, is it, uh, are the Kurdish parties going to, P PYD will participate? Uh, will there be any discussions about that? And also you comment about recent uh, uh, um, interview of, of Bashar al-Assad that said there will be no peace talk uh, until all the, all the parts of Syria are, I quote, liberated from the terrorists. Okay. Thank you. Um, regarding the first one, it, the issue is going to be, in fact, part of what will be discussed in Riyadh and in addition in other capitals and certainly among the Syrians because this is an opportunity for the Syrian opposition to come as inclusive as possible and uh, prepared as possible. We already have the list of the Syrian government. There are more than 40 people. We already know who is actually leading them at uh, the Geneva discussions. But it's extremely important now to have a cohesive, comprehensive, well-inclusive Syrian opposition one. I think we can get there because the acceleration which has been taking place on Vienna is helping every country who has an influence to help them to actually do so. And I know there is some training taking place too. Regarding the other aspect that you just mentioned, I was traveling yesterday on the plane, so I didn't see the interview, but I, I, I read some of it. I don't make comments on the statements which are going to be made or will be making. You should know one thing, and uh, I think uh, I would like your help in interpreting all this. Remember, based on 43 years of experience, every time there is a political process starting and the possibility of a ceasefire, there are going to be a lot of statements which are in effect preparing, prepositioning, positioning the sides what matters is what happens in the Vienna meetings and what will happen in the negotiations. There will also be, I'm afraid, and you should know it, there is always, when there is a ceasefire coming up, a temptation to actually have better military position. So please help me to interpret this not as a breach of the Vienna momentum, but unfortunately some of the collateral effects when you talk about a ceasefire. Um, sorry. I, you got your turn, please. Uh. Thank you. Uh, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. On the issue of a ceasefire, um, as you appear to just allude to, uh, some people think that it's really an impossibility and 
uh, basically, especially in a country where you have the Islamic State and other es extremist groups <laughs> operating. Um, and there's been some um, speculation that one reason for doing this is that you would then be able to pinpoint, well, who's a terrorist and who's a member of the opposition. Um, that, that, that this would actually be a delineation. Could you talk about prospects for a ceasefire? Are we gonna see something possibly by the end of the year? How do you answer these critics? And what about distinguishing between terrorists and opposition members? Okay, regarding uh, the issue of ceasefire, uh, we are talking in Vienna, and we, we are talking about as large as possible national ceasefire, not just local ceasefires, which have been taking place, some of them breached, and some have taken place afterwards. We are talking about a large ceasefire. Now, why is this now more likely, I'm not saying guaranteed, but more likely than before? Well, first of all, because there are uh, indications that those countries who are inside the Vienna meeting room and look at them who they are and those uh, who are therefore involved or, or have the capacity of influencing those who are fighting have a interest in seeing a ceasefire taking place. If that is the case then what is missing is the alibi for a ceasefire and the alibi for a ceasefire is a political process. This is true because uh, you can't ask opposition or even government, but frankly opposition, to stop fighting unless they don't see in front of them a political horizon. That's why the two connected. Now regarding the issue about the ceasefire and what about ISIL territory, for instance, very good point. Look at the map. We look at it together and you'll see a whole gray area, largely desertic, but with places like Palmyra, like Raqqa, who are naturally not going to be part of the ceasefire because you can't imagine ISIL wanting or accepting or the international community wanting or accepting a ceasefire. So the issue would be between the other sides, excluding that one. We should you. give a floor to a lady, I hope. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. good, okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for taking the question. Um, there were talks about a local ceasefire in eastern Ghouta overnight that fell apart. What does that tell you about the prospects of a nationwide ceasefire? And secondly, how do you intend to persuade opposition parties to come to any talks without a resolution on the question of President Assad? Regarding the issue of uh, a Ghouta, we had a, a, we monitored very carefully, as you know. There have been other ceasefires. You have the opportunity of looking, for instance, at Zabadani, Kefray, and Fua, where we do, did contribute to facilitate a meeting between them. Um, it worked. In Kefray, Fua, and I must say Zabadani, since 23rd of September, the ceasefires hold. Why? because uh, the Iranian side was actively involved, and on the other side, the opposition was uh, also actively involved with the support of countries who support them. There was a common interest in doing so. I believe that that's the difference between local ceasefires without an engagement of foreign sponsors or those who have an influence have uh, more unlikelihood to hold. But when we talk about everyone else getting involved in it, like we had to a certain degree in Kefraya for, for and Zabadani, the chances are higher. Now, regarding the uh, willingness of the opposition to attend a meeting in Geneva, um, the good thing about Vienna was uh, that uh, there was an agreement that uh, we would, uh, they would continue disagreeing on certain issues and they agreed to disagree, and they would address those issues later. But there was an agreement about something that everyone, including the opposition, has been looking very carefully. Look at the scenario. Look at paragraph seven of uh, uh, the Vienna one. We are talking about Geneva communique. We are talking about immediately afterwards a governance, all inclusive, credible, non-sectarian, and then you're talking about a new constitution, repeat, 
new constitution and elections, including elections which go beyond those of simple the parliament. That's quite a package that even a very, very disappointed opposition could look at with interest. Thank you very much. Mr. President. Uh, we regret that there's no more time for questions. Let me just say, uh, of course, the framework for peace will hopefully be established through the Security Council after successful, uh, hopefully, outcome in Vienna. But this is, and that's why we had this briefing today, and we are very thankful for Mr. Di Mistura to turn up to the general membership. This is a crisis, this is a conflict, and this is a humanitarian uh, crisis of huge dimensions of interest to each and every of uh, countries in the United Nations. And that's why, uh, as you may have heard, this afternoon at 3 o'clock, there will be an other informal meeting with the General Assembly on the humanita global humanitarian crisis, uh, also, of course, with much focus on the situation in Syria and around. And tomorrow, on the request of Turkey, there will be a formal debate in the General Assembly on the uh, humanitarian crisis around the Mediterranean basin. We'll come back to you after that. Thank you very much. We'll talk about it after they've taken place. <laughs>